So everybody knows that Bonnie and Clyde terrorized the central United States during the Great Depression. But what most people don't know is that these antics occurred over a very short period of time. And you're gonna learn all about it in today's episode. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. Today, we're going to be continuing the true crime series. We're gonna be taking a look at the story of Bonnie and Clyde. We're gonna take a look at their childhood and how they grew up. We're gonna look at how they met. Uh, we're gonna look at their most significant criminal capers, including the murders. Then we're gonna look at the man who hunted them down and ended their crime spree. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share me on social media. And without further ado, let's talk about the story of Bonnie and Clyde. So Bonnie and Clyde were an American criminal couple who traveled the central United States during the Great Depression, robbing banks and stores and gas stations and armories. Their exploits captured the attention of the media and the nation during the crime spree between 1931 and 1934. Their story has been the subject of numerous movies and television shows. Most recently on Netflix in 2019 was The Highwayman. Uh, that tells the story of Bonnie and Clyde, but from the perspective of law enforcement. So who were these people? Well, Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born in 1910. She grew up in the urban slum area of West Dallas. Her family was very poor. In her youth, uh, she enjoyed photography and writing poetry. When she was 15 years old, she dropped out of high school and she got married. Unfortunately, her husband spent most of his time in prison. In fact, while the two were never formally divorced, Bonnie would never see her first husband and her only actual legal husband after January of 2029. At age 19, Bonnie was working as a waitress in the Dallas area, and she often wrote in her diary about her loneliness. Well, that was until she met Clyde. Clyde Chestnut Barrow was born in 1909 and he also grew up extremely poor in West Texas. In fact, his family was so poor that they slept under a wagon until they could save enough money to buy a tent. Imagine that. Clyde's teenage years were spent mostly stealing cars with plenty of other robberies sprinkled in. Bonnie and Clyde first met at a friend's house in January of 1930 and they both were immediately smitten with one another. Unfortunately, by April of 1930, Clyde was sent to Eastham Prison Farm. Now, Bonnie, being his faithful companion, she smuggled him in a tool that actually helped him escape from the prison. Now, his time on the lamb was short-lived, and when he was captured, he was returned to Eastham, but he was put in a much more secure area. It was in this new area where two bad things were happening to Clyde. Number one, Clyde had to do hard labor, which he hated. And number two, at night, Clyde was being sexually assaulted and victimized by another inmate in the prison. So to solve the first problem of doing hard labor, uh, Clyde learned that if he were missing some toes, he would be exempted. So he actually took an ax and chopped off two of his toes. It was an extreme measure, but it did disqualify him from hard labor. As for the second problem, well, Clyde waited until the time was right and then he attacked his tormentor with a lead pipe, crushing his skull and killing him. Fortunately for Clyde, a fellow inmate who was already doing a life sentence took the rap for him. Clyde was paroled in February of 1932, but he was a changed man at this point. His sister said, and I quote, something awful must have happened to him in that prison because he wasn't the same person when he got out. And another fellow inmate said that while he was in prison with Clyde, he watched him turn from, quote, a schoolboy 
into a rattlesnake. Upon Clyde's release, his stated mission in life was not fame, it wasn't fortune, he wanted revenge. He wanted revenge on the Eastham prison for the abuses that occurred during his confinement. And, you know, he wanted to free the friends uh, that he had made while he was at the prison. Regardless, now a free man, he immediately went to robbing banks and grocery stores and gas stations. His favorite weapon was a 1918 Browning automatic rifle, referred to as a BAR or a BAR. It was an automatic assault rifle that served him well because he usually had law enforcement outgunned whenever shootouts occurred. Now, reunited in 1932, it didn't take Bonnie and Clyde long to team up on some robberies. Unfortunately, on April 19, 1932, Bonnie and Clyde hit a hardware store. Clyde got away, but Bonnie did not, and she spent the next few months in the county jail where she spent her time mostly writing poetry to pass the time. So Bonnie and Clyde were separated again. While Bonnie sat in jail that summer, Clyde was drinking moonshine at a county dance in Oklahoma when he shot and killed Sheriff C.G. Maxwell. This was his second murder, but it was his first murder of a law enforcement officer. By fall, Bonnie was released from jail and the two reunited. And on Christmas Eve of 1932, they teamed up with a 16-year-old boy named W.D. Jones, and they headed out into the world to raise some hell. And boy, did they. The very next day, on Christmas Day, they killed a man while stealing his car. And 10 days later, they murdered a deputy in Tarrant County, Texas. From there, they drifted around engaging in general mischief. But their reputation for lawlessness was growing. One of the things that Bonnie loved to do when they had downtime was to have them pose for photographs. They would be holding guns or pointing guns at each other. Look like kind of outlaw glamour shots, if you will. Now, in March of 1933, Clyde's brother Buck was released from prison, and they all met up at a house in a quiet little neighborhood in Joplin, Missouri. It's actually about an hour west of where I'm sitting right now filming this episode. They called the place their hideout. It's located at 3347 one half Oak Ridge Drive in Joplin, Missouri, and it's still there today, and you can visit it. So there they were, Bonnie and Clyde, his brother Buck, and his wife Blanche, and don't forget the kid, W.D. Jones. This is the crew that would eventually be known as the Barrow Gang. Now, while they were at the hideout in Joplin, Missouri, uh, instead of hiding out, they partied. They drank all hours of the day and the night. They had alcohol-fueled card games. There was gunplay. There was riffraff coming and going all hours of the day and night. Well, Needless to say, it didn't take the neighbors long to get a belly full of the Barrow Gang and their antics. And so they called in law enforcement. So on April 13th of 1933, law enforcement rolls up on the hideout in Joplin, Missouri. And, of course, a shootout ensued. This time, Bonnie had the bar rifle. And when the dust settled, two law enforcement officers were dead, and the Barrow Gang was forced to flee the hideout. Now, while they got away, they were forced to leave most of their possessions at the hideout in Joplin. And in investigating the scene, law enforcement discovered numerous weapons, a now famous poem written by Bonnie called Suicide Sal, and most importantly, several rolls of undeveloped film. Police took the undeveloped rolls of film down to the Joplin Globe, which was a local newspaper, and they developed the film in the darkroom. What they saw was probably the single most important reason why Bonnie and Clyde are legendary and not just forgotten criminals. Now, recalling that Bonnie loved photography, these rolls that were developed by law enforcement showed lots of staged, posed photographs. They were full of weapons uh, and loot, basically glorifying these outlaws. And of course, the most iconic picture of all time that was taken of Bonnie. It's the photo of Bonnie posing with a cigar clenched in her teeth and a gun in her hand. 
It's an absolute classic. So the Joplin Globe sent these photographs and the poem over the newswire, and the Barrow Gang became front page news throughout America. Now recall in 1933, the nation was four years into a Great Depression. So Americans were none too fond of banks and financial institutions that were foreclosing on their homes and foreclosing on their family farm. Bonnie and Clyde's exploits had already gotten the attention of the nation, but with these new iconic photographs, these outlaw glamour shots as I called them, now the nation could put a face with a name. As these pictures circulated on every major newspaper in the country, the nation fell in love with this young, attractive couple that was sticking it to the man. They were taken back from these sinister banks. And the popularity of Bonnie and Clyde exploded. So from mid-April until June of 1933, they continued their crime spree. They robbed banks. They kidnapped a few victims, which they surprisingly let go with some money for their troubles. Odd enough. But with their newfound stardom came a lot of trouble. They couldn't just stay in motels and eat in restaurants anymore. They were wanted, and everybody in America knew exactly what they looked like now. So they spent a lot of time sleeping in the car, cooking by campfire, and bathing in stream. Now on June 10th of 1933, disaster struck the gang in Wellington, Texas when Clyde missed a bridge under construction sign and he flipped the car with he and Bonnie inside. Now Bonnie's leg was trapped and it was doused with battery acid and she was severely burned. Now Bonnie and Clyde were able to stumble to a nearby farmhouse for help, but they ultimately rendezvoused with Buck and Blanche in Arkansas, where they had hoped they could rest for a spell and nurse Bonnie's significant wounds. Unfortunately, after a bungled robbery attempt and the killing of another town marshal, the Barrow Gang had to flee yet again, and they headed back to Missouri. In early July of 1933, the gang checks into the Red Crown Tourist Court Hotel in Platte City, Missouri. Clyde and W.D. Jones had gone into town for food and some medicine to treat Bonnie's leg, and they were, of course, immediately identified. So the sheriff put a posse together over the next couple of days, including some reinforcements down from Kansas City, and they descended upon the Barrow Gang at 11 p.m. on July 20th, 1933. And a shootout ensued. And as usual, law enforcement was grossly overmatched by the weaponry, and the gang was able to escape in their vehicle. But this time, they did not escape unscathed. Buck took a bullet to the skull, and although it wasn't fatal, he was seriously injured. And his wife Blanche, exploding glass fragments had lodged in both of her eyes, one of which she would ultimately lose sight in. So the gang fled north, and they had gone about 180 miles when they set up camp at the Dexfield Park, which was an abandoned amusement park in Dexter, Iowa. And again, it didn't take long for locals to get suspicious and for authorities to descend upon the gang at the park. Another shootout ensued, but this time Buck was shot and ultimately killed and Blanche was taken into custody. The three that did escape stole cars, robbed stores and gas stations, and replenished their arsenal when they robbed an armory in Illinois. But by September of 1933, the three were homesick and they wanted to go back to Texas. So when they arrived in Texas, W.D. Jones split off from Bonnie and Clyde and he went back to Houston where he was from and ultimately he was arrested in Houston without incident. Bonnie and Clyde went to Dallas and through the fall, Clyde continued to rob whatever he could while both of their families attended to Bonnie's considerable medical needs. It was also during this time that Clyde was planning his revenge on the Eastham prison. And on January 16th of 1934, Clyde achieved his ultimate goal and he sprung several of his friends from the prison in what was called a brazen raid. It was during this Eastham breakout that Major Joe Crossan was shot and killed. And 
That was basically the final straw for the government. Bonnie and Clyde's antics were bad enough, but the Easton breakout was an embarrassment to the state of Texas. It was an embarrassment to the Department of Corrections, and it was an embarrassment to law enforcement everywhere. So this incident attracted the full power of the state of Texas and the full power of the federal government. They specifically sought out a guy to head up a manhunt for Bonnie and Clyde, and he had one job, hunt them down. The man they selected, Frank Homer a retired Texas Ranger with quite a reputation. During his career, he was officially credited with 53 kills in capturing and shooting Texas criminals. He also had 17 wounds himself. So this was your badass tough guy. And on February 10th of 1934, Frank Homer started the job. He lived out of his car, he tracked the barrel gang, and often was just a town or two behind them. It was at this point that Henry Methvin, who is one of the individuals that Clyde had freed from the Easton prison, he became a regular member of the new Barrow Gang. On Easter Sunday of 1934, the gang killed a highway patrolman in Grapevine, Texas. And five days later, they killed a constable in Oklahoma. The gang was now in double digits when it came to murder. And these killings again made national news but now public opinion had changed and they were clamoring for the capture of the Barrel Gang. And it was after these Easter killings that for the first time the government had put a bounty on Bonnie and Clyde's heads. And Texas Ranger Frank Homer was closing in. He had been charting the movements for four months and he noticed a consistent pattern. And on May 21st of 1934, he got the break he was needing. The gang had been separated, and Homer learned that they were planning to rendezvous at Methvin's parents' home in Louisiana. So Homer set up an ambush on Route 154 heading into town. And they waited, and nothing happened. Day two was May 22nd of 1934. They waited again, and again, Nothing happened. On day three, which was May 23rd of 1934, when they were about to give up, they saw Bonnie and Clyde's Ford V8 roll into view. It was 9.15 a.m. in the morning, and here was the plan. Palmer had persuaded Methvin's father to use their family vehicle as bait. Now, accounts differ on whether Dad was a willing participant in this plan, but regardless, Homer placed the Methvin vehicle on the side of the road, the edge of the highway, so that it would look like it was broken down. They had hoped that Bonnie and Clyde would recognize the vehicle and slow down to take a closer look. And they did. The plan worked like a charm. As Bonnie and Clyde slowed to take a look at the vehicle, Homer's crew opened fire from the tree line. And boy, did they ever. When the dust settled, over 130 rounds had been fired. The vehicle Bonnie and Clyde were in sustained 112 bullet holes. The official coroner's report listed 17 entrance wounds for Clyde and 26 for Bonnie, many of them fatal. Witnesses reported the sound as deafening, and it drew an immediate crowd. And then once the crowd realized it was Bonnie and Clyde, Everybody tried to grab a souvenir. People grabbed shell casings. They grabbed glass off the ground. A lady actually cut a lock of Bonnie's hair off, and a man was trying to cut off the trigger finger of Clyde when law enforcement finally regained control of the scene. At the end of the day, Bonnie and Clyde were dead. Bonnie was 23, and Clyde was 25. They were confirmed to have killed at least 13 individuals and suspected in many more deaths. Ultimately, Bonnie Parker was buried in the Crown Hill Cemetery in Dallas, Texas, with over 20,000 people attending her funeral. Clyde Barrow had a much quieter service, and he is buried in the Western Heights Cemetery in Dallas, Texas. His grave marker reads, Gone, but not forgotten. And how, my friend? Buck Barrow is buried in the same cemetery as his brother. As for his wife, Blanche Barrow, remember she was taken into custody at the amusement park in Iowa. She went on to serve six years and then she was released. She then remarried and although permanently blind in one eye, 
she lived out her days on the right side of the law and ended up dying of cancer in 1988. W.D. Jones was convicted of murder and spent 15 years in prison. Ultimately, he was released, but he was killed in an argument in 1974. Frank Homer, the Texas Ranger, re-retired and he lived a quiet life until he died of cancer in 1955. Henry Methvin, he was convicted for several crimes and served eight years. He was released but killed six years later after being struck by a train. Some call it an accident. Some say he was pushed. And last but not least, what about the bullet-ridden Ford V8? Well, it's presently on display at Whiskey Pete's Resort and Casino in Prim, Nevada. And that's the true story of Bonnie and Clyde. I hope you've enjoyed the recounting of the story of Bonnie and Clyde. If you did, hit that like button for me. If you've got a question or a comment, put it in the comment section below. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. And last but not least, you guys know it, that I love it when you share me on social media. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money. Dead, get me out of this.